I think we've got everybody coming in. So you ready to start, Brad? Let's go ahead, Sarah. All right. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to our What's New This Wednesday webinar. This is our series that we started a while ago, and we will continue every Wednesday at noon Eastern time. We'll be here with something new and interesting going on. And this week, we have Brad Rathgeber, head of school at One Schoolhouse. And Brad, Happy New Year, right? Happy New Year. Happy New School Year, Sarah. Yeah. I know. That, for us, that makes more sense in September, doesn't it? <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's good to have the school year start. Uh, you know, it's funny, Sarah, uh, in that, uh, you know, the school year for us starts right in the middle of September. Um, and the issues that have been top of mind for us are probably not the issues that have been top of mind for everybody else in schools right now. We're not thinking about hygiene protocols and things like that. Instead, we're thinking about just making sure that an even greater number of kids have an exceptional online experience. So it's a little bit different this school year, and yet in some ways it's, it's a little bit more normal than I think um, a lot of schools are, are wrestling with right now. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, um, and you mentioned, you know, a greater number of kids, because there's a lot more this year, aren't there? There are. This year we have we probably end up with somewhere around 40 to 45 percent more students this year in one schoolhouse courses than we had the previous year. Um, and the previous year, we had had 30% more kids. So in the last couple of years, we pretty much doubled uh, the number of students that we're serving. Yeah. And so when I think about you and your role, and um, you wrote a blog post recently that you had a chance to do some reflecting and thinking about insights that we've learned over the last six months. And um, wow. There's a lot that's happened in the last six months, but you have been living this life of there's a lot going on for, for quite some time. Yeah, you know, Sarah, it's, it's funny. As I've been talking to school leaders um, and association directors and folks kind of within the independent school world, one of the things that really struck me is that, um, that a lot of school leaders right now are feeling like I felt when I was helping to start the online school for girls, one schoolhouse back 11 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. It seems that we're kind of like in startup mode. Um, and in startup mode, uh, you're constantly iterating, you're constantly changing, you're constantly rethinking things. Um, quite frankly, you have sleepless nights and you have uh, days when you're not your best self um, because you're changing at such a rapid rate. It seemed to me that it was just so similar to what I experienced years ago, um, the type of environment that school leaders were in these days. Of course, the big change was, or the big difference is, you know, I went into that with eyes wide open um, and kind of wanting to get into that role, whereas most school leaders, this was kind of forced upon them. Um, and yet in a time of constant change, you're learning so much about who you are as an organization um, in really important and impactful ways. You know, that's, that's such a good observation. One is there's the startup mode because you want to be in and startup mode because everything's changed. But then that ability to, to have some discernment and to see some things that you may not have seen before. Before I ask you about that, what, when you think about startup mode and sort of what leaders might want to have top of mind is there in that you mentioned that they're iterating and certainly, you know, we know school leaders face scenarios where, okay, here's what's going to happen. Oh gosh, new updates, new news. That's not what's going to happen. I have to change. Right. What are some ways that leaders can, can manage being in that environment? <laughs> I think the first thing is just to be kind to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> know, know that you are, are in this kind of top teacher world and, and take some time as best as you possibly can to be kind to yourself. Uh, know that you're not going to be as quote unquote perfect as you can be when we're in a normal school cycle, right? Like in a normal mm -hmm. school cycle, there's, there's kind of milestones and mile markers and guideposts that, that create this kind of cyclical, uh, cyclical process, right? So we know that every September we're doing this and every October we're doing this and in November we're doing this and December is this. I, in this mode, that's, that's just thrown off the loop. Um, 
right. you know, maybe, maybe, it, maybe people aren't thinking of in kind of the startup mode, but it's almost, almost like you're back to being the first year in that leadership role too, where everything is new at you. Everything is different. Um, and I think that folks really just need to take time to time for themselves in this, in this space too. And to, to, to just, uh, be kind to yourself and, and, uh, and not be too hard on yourself during this time. Yeah, and you mentioned sleepless nights, and I think that's um, one of the things. I think when you get to that point where you're having those sleepless nights, it's time to say, okay, we've got to kind of figure this out. And uh, Lori Palco, who teaches a course for us, talks about the idea that you, you know, if you're on an airplane and you're carrying somebody with you who you're responsible for, you've got to put on your own oxygen mask so that you can take care of them and get theirs on them. And I think that's some, some good insight there too. Absolutely. So, so you wrote the blog post and um, you divided into kind of three questions, three sections, and then you have some really interesting questions in your piece. And so my favorite question, which is um, in that middle section is what structures were psychosanct in a pre COVID world that we learned we could live without. Tell me about some of your thinking behind that question. It's my favorite question too, sir. Um, <laughs> uh, so in a typical life of a school, we are constantly running from this event to that event, to the next event, to the fourth or fifth or sixth event, right? And we recognized over the course of this spring that we didn't necessarily need to be doing all of those different events. Um, that we probably could strip things down to the essence of our school culture and the essence of the traditions that we wanted to continue. I remember back in the spring, we said to schools, um, if you can, make sure that you have an archivist throughout this time, somebody who's documenting out uh, what it is you're changing and why and what the impact has been on the school culture. I think that that's important going through this school year too, because you're making a lot of changes to simplify down to the core of what the school is. I particularly think that this is an interesting question for schools to ask, having sat on an administrative team at an independent school for a number of years. Um, I remember when I was an administrator at Holton Arms, we had uh, three or four three hour long administrative team meetings a year that were just devoted to figuring out the calendar for the upcoming school year. Literally, we had like wow. five different buckets of like, these were level one events and these were level two events and these were level three. And, and we went through and, and figured out how all of them fit into the calendar of the school year. It seemed crazy yeah. to me at the time, a little bit, you know, like we were doing so much. Um, and we never kind of stepped back and said, why are we doing this much? Do we need to do this much? I think independent schools have been in this, in this rush for the, like, the last 10, 15 years of adding this and that and the third thing, mm -hmm. adding this program, adding a makerspace, adding this language, adding all of these different things. And I think that this is a real moment for us to kind of step back from all of those things that we've added and start to figure out the real meaning behind the work that we're doing. And making sure that what we're actually doing with our students has deep meaning and ideally ties really well to uh, the mission of the school and the outcomes that we're trying to reach. So I love hearing that you had some of those long meetings because I always wondered <laughs> when I was sitting in those calendar meetings, surely this cannot be this hard. And yet it seems like it is. And uh, Vinny Rotney at the Kincaid School has done a presentation at a few different places where he's talked about sunsetting and mm -hmm. how agonizing it is to sunset something. Um, and, and I think we struggle with that as independent schools. And I think that your instinct to really look at the why and are we living our mission in each one of those? And, you know, also, is it doing something that nothing else does? Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, Sarah, in, in, we talked about this a little bit and we talked about this even in spring webinars a little bit too, that uh, when you operate in the online space or I'd even say the hybrid space, you have to be significantly more intentional about what you're trying to achieve. You have to be intentional about what your outcomes are. You have to be intentional about how you're reaching different things in order to make sure that you're actually doing it. Um, I think that that, that, that 
kind of laser focus on what we are actually trying to do can help give us some lenses to figuring out what might be sunsetted um, moving forward. That's a great point. And, um, and when you think about that role of the archivist, you mentioned that, and I just think that's so important. If, if there's a school out there that is thinking, gosh, I'm not even sure what happened because we were so in motion, maybe right now is the time before, before you get too deep into this year to do some documenting of what happened at the end of last year, um, if that didn't get to happen yet. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. So, so how do school leaders ask the right questions? Because, you know, one of the things that I know everybody wants to ask you about is, so what are the answers? But really, what are the questions that need to be asked? Yeah, you know, Sarah, I, I, I think that so many of the questions that schools need to be asking are actually school and, uh, and market specific. Um, they're uh, and, and ideally, again, starting with the mission. I'm glad we have Peter on here today. And Peter, feel free to add your voice into this, into this part of this as well. Um, I, schools that are laser focused on uh, meeting their mission um, are going to find that they need to be asking different questions today than they did last year at this time in order to make sure that in a hybrid world, in an online world, in a world moving forward, in a post-COVID pandemic world, um, we're meeting our missions as fully as we possibly can be. I think that schools are going to want to think very carefully about making sure that the lessons that they've learned from this time can be carried forward to in, uh, uh, in really substantive ways. I, I wrote in the blog post, Sarah, for example, that colleges and universities learned 10 years ago that it wasn't enough to just simply have a campus in Cambridge or Chapel Hill or Berkeley or some other place. Um, that with the way that they can reach out across the world differently, they can have that wonderful place-based experience, but they can also supplement that experience with tremendous online offerings. So I think it's important for schools to ask themselves questions around, okay, we've tried this with our students. Are there places that we want to make sure that we're retaining this online or hybrid component? We had to reach out to our alumni base in a different way than we did before. Are there ways that we can engage our alums differently, particularly those alums that are not in um, the location that we're in? Even work with faculty uh, and work with colleagues from around the country. I know this is something we might wanna dive into a little bit further, but I've never seen the independent school community um, as collegial and supportive and helpful uh, as it has been to each other over the last six months. And that's, that's a great point, right? Like, and, and, and it's not just, I think we're learning that it's not just about kind of gathering in our local city with like-minded folks, but that we're expanding a network that is national and international in a really different and good way. We're able to find colleagues who are like-minded in different and new ways. And we're able to rely upon this incredible international network of folks in wonderful ways. I love that you use the word international. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I mean, look at, look at like the academic leaders listserv. There isn't a day that goes by that somebody isn't posting a question out there and getting nine responses from around the world. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, right? And we would sort of think in those ways pre-pandemic, we, we might, put something out there in a listserv, but this is becoming like essential to the ways that we are operating and functioning. It, it's, it's, you know, it, it goes into kind of some of the cohorting that we've been doing over the last number of months where folks are just gathering to really talk deeply about different issues that we're experiencing or problems that we have and are connecting and finding different, uh, different answers than we've ever found before. It's exciting and inspiring even during these really challenging times. So I, I like that you said inspiring too, because um, when I think about the international school community and sort of some of the generosity of spirit in the international mm. schools, when they shared their experiences when schools in the US were kind of going up, ooh, 
where we headed and then just due to differences in the way the school years are set up and the way um, schools have to follow different laws depending on where they are there was a lot of insight to be gleaned in the international school experience and i think that would be something that is it's not fragile but i would want us to cling to that right like let's keep that community on that larger scale together absolutely absolutely whatever we can do to make sure that we're we're strengthening and continuing to strengthen those connections is, is going to be important and helpful for schools and I want to remind everybody, um, if you've got a question for Brad, please go ahead and um, put that in the Q&A and not in the chat. We Sometimes in the chat, things slide by really quickly. So if you'll put that in the Q&A. And Brad, there's two questions I still want to ask you about a little bit. And one is, what do you worry about, right? What would be, what would be the downside? Like, What's the negative that if we if we come out here and you're just hoping that we aren't somewhere? Yeah, I, it seems to me that schools uh, that we need to embrace the ideas that schools will be different in a post COVID pandemic world than going into uh, the COVID pandemic. That is, uh, I am worried that schools will try to get back to normal rather than addressing uh, and, uh, and running into a new normal or a next normal or a post-pandemic normal or whatever it might be, whatever phraseology you might want to use for that. Um, I'm worried that folks will revert rather than progress. And that's, I think, Sarah, where, why I'm so inspired by the collegiality um, that the community has had. Uh, and um, and inspired by the ways that people have been super creative during this time. Sometimes, sometimes structures that seem like impediments can actually um, inspire creativity beyond what we've ever seen. And I think we're seeing a little bit of that right now. We're seeing folks be super creative because they have structures that they haven't had around them before. Even even honestly, in terms of like regulations and laws that we're dealing with, right? Like we have, and, and this is actually, this is very similar to a startup too. When you're, when you're working in a startup space, you end up hitting a lot of laws and regulations um, that are different because you're creating something by definition that doesn't work in the same kind of box, right? right? And so you end up hitting against regulators and laws and things in a bunch of different ways. Um, I'll give a super easy example, perhaps that, that fits in the school realm. You know, uh, an organization like the NCAA back when we started didn't know how to deal with our type of online classes or creditors didn't quite know how to accredit us, right? We're kind of hitting against some of those regulators right now, which is creating boxes that we've never had to work with before, whether it's you can only have this number of kids on campus or only this number of kids can be in a room or you can't have any kids on campus or whatever the regulations in our local areas might be. It's actually making us be more creative. It's actually making us solve problems really differently. So if we're solving these problems differently now and we figured out ways um, to solve problems differently than we ever had before, we shouldn't throw away those answers when we're able to be on campus again. We should figure out how to use those answers really effectively and practically when appropriate for different types of uh, settings. We know that we're reaching some kids differently in our classrooms than we ever have before in really, really mm -hmm. good ways. We also know that some kids are really struggling in this type of learning environment. We should be worrying about how we can make sure that those kids who are struggling can find the supports and structures that, we, that they need in order to find success. However, on the opposite side, we should absolutely be figuring out why is this a really great learning environment for this set of kids? What can we learn that is going really well for these kids that we can continue when we're able to be back on campus full time? I'm, I am slightly worried, Sarah, you can probably hear this hesitation here. I'm slightly worried that we're so focused on the negative that we aren't actually taking the time to figure out what's going really well and figure out how we can make sure that what's going really well can continue in a post-COVID pandemic world. 
So I'm going to, if you can hear me for a minute here, I'm going to draw a poetry analogy. <laughs> but so highly structured forms of poetry that are a challenge to write. Poets who we follow and know and love and Mary Oliver, for example, um, write those highly structured forms, even if those don't end up being their most beloved and published pieces, and sometimes they are, but because the discipline of having to really find the exact right word yep. is so beautiful. And then you transfer that discipline to your free verse or your song lyrics, but you don't, you don't settle for the word that just seems okay because you have that discipline from having to find the exact syllables that match. And so, you know, you have to find the perfect word. Right. And I think that this is maybe that opportunity in some ways for schools to think about, we have found a way to really identify how to reach this student and we're never going to let that go. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's where that's where making sure that you're actually documenting what's going well and what's not going well is super, super important. I, that would be my one piece of advice to schools right now is make sure that you're documenting that out. Um, I think that's a great piece. And um, Peter has sent me something here, so I'm going to share that. Um, Use your mission and your values in everything you know. Figure out who your school is. What's your essence? What's your reason or justification for existing? Figure it out and then be it to the max. And don't see yourself as, it, as indispensable as you are. How do you adapt to be indispensable in the new circumstances? And he calls it the wrinkle in time argument. Mm -hmm. I love that idea of indispensable. What makes a school indispensable? And there's yeah. a and lot of different answers to that question, There's a lot right? of different answers. I mean, this is, this is the fun of what makes us all great independent schools is that we can answer that question really differently. But again, I, it, it also means that we're not answering it the same way. We're not answering it by just piling on and piling on and piling on anymore. We're actually diving deeply into that question and trying to figure out what it means to be indispensable to our community, whatever way, shape, and form that kind of takes, right? Is that the local community? Is that the boarding school community? Mm -hmm. Whatever that community is, how are we indispensable to that community does not mean just continuing to add on. So that's another opportunity here too. In addition to kind of documenting what's going well and what's not going well is taking this as a pause. We have stripped school down to its essence in a lot of different ways. Take that as a super wonderful gift, considering how much we have been adding on and adding on and adding on to be able to create what that next normal might be for that school that makes you even more indispensable for your future self. Yeah. I, it, Sarah, there, there's been, you know, we've talked about this kind of in a classroom sense, we've talked about this in other senses too. You've created great community tra transition or traditions during this time too. Right? Some of the things that the kids have done have been just super, super inspiring. And the ways that you've unleashed their creativity, the ways you've engaged them in their student government in order to make sure that, okay, this tra tradition can't be done in this way this year, but now we can do it in this way. What's going really well there? Like, how are we actually meeting, uh, meeting the, uh, and creating community effectively in this space that, again, we don't want to lose in a post-pandemic world? You know, you use the word community, and what I'm also struck by is something that Kareem Dadini says um, when she talks about student voice, that students' voices are the best insights we have into what's going on in their minds, and that anything we can do that elevates that gives us greater insight into how that student's learning is going. And yep. uh, I think that applies here in, in that broader sense too, right? What are the voices that we're really focusing in on and elevating and listening to as we move forward? And how are you capturing those voices, right? Making mm -hmm. sure that you're actually capturing those voices really, really carefully and clearly. 
at, at one schoolhouse we've been and some of you have heard me say this before we are super focused on what the student experience is and making sure that we really listen to what the kids experience the kids lived experiences in their in our courses are I would so encourage schools to make sure that you are polling regularly your kids, seeing how, seeing what their lived experience in your classes is, figuring out if you really are meeting the outcomes that you're trying to meet. Um, we've been polling kids for years on the same questions at one schoolhouse to make sure that we're actually meeting what we say we're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we take the responses from the kids super seriously. I still to this day read every comment that every kid puts in a student survey because I think that that gives me as the school head the best sense of what's actually going on. In some ways, I feel like I have a better sense of what's going on within the one schoolhouse school because I get that feedback regularly and I get the student voice really regularly than I ever did as a division director walking down the hall. Because as a division director walking down the hall, I'd inevitably get the same voices coming at me, right? I get so and so student who, you know, would want to approach me and tell me what they thought, but I wouldn't get a number of other students' voices. That's like really collecting interesting. Collecting regular feedback, right, and making sure that there's a space where everybody knows that we are interested in how they're experiencing their classes. In our case, their school in independent schools cases. We're really making sure that we're elevating the student voice to a different level. You know, I want to just hone in on something that you said, too, because you talked about responding. So it's not just listening, it's responding. So asking questions with the intent to adjust in response to the feedback that you get. And I think that's critical. And being, sure, and being open about the feedback and where the criticisms are, right? Like being, mm -hmm. being able to accept that and pivot. Right. We do it, we do, so as I said, we do five surveys a year. We do one survey that's just two weeks into the school year. And that's kind of, that, that is probably the most critical survey that we do. The rest of them can be a little bit reflective and can help us like shift courses a little bit. But two weeks into the school year, if something's not going right, we need to know that and we need to address it. So it becomes really important to um, making sure that the student experience starts off as, as good as possible. I think um, that's a really wise message for here. We've only got a couple minutes left and we got one question in. Someone wanted to ask a question anonymously. Um, how do leaders discern in the voices what the priorities are for needs versus wants? <laughs> and um, that's a tough question. <laughs> That is a tough question, right? But a lot of it, again, goes hopefully back to the outcomes that you're trying to achieve and the mission that you have at your school. Um, I, needs versus wants is really, is really a, a huge challenge that, that, schools, uh, that schools are navigating, particularly in regards to faculty, um, faculty requests for different things. Um, I, to me, it goes back to the, to the mission and outcomes that you're trying to achieve, though. I, it's super simple examples, right? Like, relate to technology. So, mm -hmm. Sarah, I know you've talked mm -hmm. about this a lot during kind of and other webinars. We've talked about how simple technology is the best technology. Um, and how many times faculty members will think that they need certain technologies in order to accomplish the outcomes within their classes when really those are wants, not needs, right? And there may be some, right? There may be some competing example, or there may be some competing, um, some competing wants in there too, um, that make it so that uh, you can't address or can't give uh, what it is that that faculty member, that particular faculty member may want. Honing in yeah, and being really careful though about like, what you're trying to achieve allows you to make that decision much more carefully and in a way that can be respected um, by the entire community. Mm -hmm. And I think um, you've said before, the simplest solution that will probably work is, is the best place to start. And I also think that what you alluded to that I'm just going to sum up as, is it student centered or teacher centered? Because yeah. teacher centered teaching 
is so easy to slip into if you start saying, well, what tool do you need to do your class and what tool do you need to do your class? And it's not just, that doesn't just happen in tech tools. It happens lots of different ways. Um, but when we see, when the student's in the middle and we think about the support that that student needs to succeed and then plugging in all of those pieces, that's actually when teachers thrive too. Sarah, if, if I can sum up kind of, you know, one of the other things that I'm most optimistic about is that we are focusing much more on the student experience these days. And if schools are working towards a post-pandemic normal um, that, that focuses much more on the voice, that elevates the voices of kids and focuses much more on the student experience within our buildings, um, we're going to be better off. Yeah, I think that is a lovely way to close. So I want to thank everybody for coming here. We ran a couple of minutes over time, but I'm so glad that you said that to close us. Ah, well, take care, everyone. Take care of, of each other and yourselves. And uh, Brad, get enough sleep. <laughs> yeah, everybody, please do that. <laughs> All righty. Thanks, Sarah. Take care. Bye-bye.